Hello everyone, good evening, and welcome to our second program in the two-part series this summer, partnering with the Medewin National Tallgrass Prairie as they celebrate their 25th anniversary. Medewin has the distinction as the first place in the country designated a national tallgrass prairie by federal law in 1996. If you are new to the Chicago Council on Science and Technology, we are a 14-year-old organization with the mission to enhance the public's understanding and appreciation of science, technology, and its impact on society. Tonight, you can visit www.c2st.org to get more information about our upcoming virtual programs or to learn how you can support future programs for C2ST. Also, please remember to sign up for our mailing list so that you can get reminders about these programs as well. And we do have some exciting news. We have a new Chicago Science and Tech Community Facebook group, and we will share the link for that group in the comments if you're interested in joining. During tonight's program, you can ask questions at any time. You can type c2st2.cnf.io into your web browser and click today's session to ask questions and also to evaluate the program at the end. Our staff will be checking C2ST TV on YouTube and Facebook Live for your questions. But remember, if you'd like to ask questions directly, you can go to c2st2.cnf.io. Let's get on to business. We have three dedicated volunteers, as well as the visitor information assistant, Laura Lewis, with us tonight as we share some of the reasons to be excited about the silver anniversary of the largest open space in northeastern Illinois. Laura Lewis has worked at Medewin National Tallgrass Prairie as a visitor information assistant for the last five years. She graduated from Southern Illinois University Carbondale with a bachelor's degree in zoology, and Laura routinely makes use of this knowledge to help teach visitors about nature and the prairie. Our first volunteer is Greg Dubois, excuse me, Greg Dubois. I probably did it wrong twice, whose contributions at Midday would include um, construction projects, photographing the different special events, interpretive services for both child and adult programs and tours, and ecological monitoring specifically for birds. Greg is the vice president and program director of the Will County Audubon and active in projects for Illinois Audubon. Then we will hear a bit from Ron Kapala, who has volunteered in Restoration, Mighty Acorns as a tour guide assistant, a tour guide, and Bison Ranger. And he assists in various other Medewin programs, both in person and virtually, as you will see tonight. And then finally, we have Dr. Christina Samet, who was drawn to this volunteer opportunity by the inspiring mission of Medewin to heal and restore almost 20,000 acres of this unique tall grass prairie ecosystem. Christina has participated in volunteer activities such as interpretive programs and ecological monitoring. If this is your first time joining us for Medewin programs, don't worry. There are so many activities and so much space at this park that we literally needed two programs to showcase it all. And so for tonight's story, we'll begin with you, Greg. Well, welcome everyone to the second part of Midday One 101. And I'm, I was looking for the slide. Here it comes. Okay, there we go. Could we, could we go back just one, Laura, please, to that introductory slide? Thank you. Thank you. So pre-European settlement, this is what we think a tall grass prairie looked like. And this slide right here is actually the, the uh, sunrise over the South Patrol Road restoration project. And what we're looking at there are at least a dozen different types of tall grass prairie plants. Uh, and as I said, this photo was taken in this, a, uh, uh, the South Patrol Road Restoration Project, and we discussed that project in part one if you missed that. And if you did, I encourage you to go back and, and look at that recording. 
and listen to, listen to that uh, uh, story that we told there. Uh, next slide, please. If you look on the right-hand side of this road, which happens to be the West Patrol Road, that is pretty much what the South Patrol Road project, restoration project, looked like before it was restored. And mostly in the foreground, you see uh, grasses, you see shrubs and small trees. And that's what happens to a tall grass prairie when you have no fire, no grazing, and the invasion of non-native plants and trees. This is what it looks like. Now, as we travel north on this road, which again is West Patrol Road, we will be passing on our left the beginning of the Blodgett Marks Trail. Now, this is a trail that's sort of in the northwest part of Medewin. It's a four and a half mile hiking only trail and it loops through Dolomite Prairie. Now, Dolomite Prairie is sort of a rare type of prairie that is characterized by little or no topsoil on top of bedrock. Now, the plants and animals that live here are specialized to exist on very wet or very dry conditions, and that's depending on the season. Next, please. We have now reached the bridge that spans Prairie Creek, and we are on that bridge looking back to the west in the direction that Prairie Creek flows. And if you look real closely, sort of in the center, upper center of the picture, thank you, Laura, that is a footbridge that is part of the Blodgett Marsh Trail that goes over Prairie Creek and on its way to the uh, Dolomite Prairie. Now, I would like you to look more closely at the character of this creek here. You'll see vegetation encroaching on the creek. You'll see sort of sandbars and little islands of vegetation in the creek. And just get a sense of what that looks like. And then we're, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to do a 180 and we're going to look back in the other direction. Go ahead, Laura, advance, please. Now, aside from the change of seasons, what we've done is we've looked back to the east on Prairie Creek, and it looks quite a bit different. Very straight. There's not a lot of encroachment of vegetation. Even in the summer, there's not a great deal. And you don't see the, the little sand bars and the little islands of vegetation on the creek. And there's a reason for that. We believe the Army dredged this creek back in the 40s to drain the land that, were, uh, that, that is east of where we're looking at right now because that land was, um, uh, as, it, as Prairie Creek flowed through it, was on both sides of Prairie Creek a large ammunition bunker field. There were bunkers on the right of this photograph in a, in a very large field, and then the majority of the bunkers were on the left. And this creek was also rerouted. It used to meander to the left as we look at it, further upstream, and then, and then flow around uh, in sort of an oxbow-like uh, formation and then re-enter the creek right before this bridge, right by that dead tree that is at the very left border of the photograph. Speaking of dead trees, they actually make up a very important habitat for birds and animals in a natural setting. They provide food for birds in the form of insects, and they provide nesting places for cavity nesting birds and cavity nesting animals like raccoons and squirrels. So now I would like you to think of what we do with dead trees around our homes or along our city streets and in our parks. What becomes of those trees? Well, if you said we cut them all down, well, you're absolutely right. But, but we're destroying habitat for lots of different kinds of birds and animals. But while we're on that subject, let's think for just a minute about what kinds of birds nest in holes in trees. 
Uh, advance, please, Laura. If you thought woodpeckers, you were absolutely right. That's, but that's just one type of birds that nest in cavities in trees. If you look on the left-hand side of the slide, that's a northern flicker. And if you look closely, just above its beak are actually particles of wood and, and sawdust that this bird is pecking out of a tree. Uh, it's actually in the process of creating a cavity for a nest. Both of these pictures were taken in Northwest Ohio, but both of these birds definitely do inhabit the Daywind property. On the right, that's a red-headed woodpecker. And even though I've seen red-headed woodpeckers at the Daywind actually standing right on the bridge that uh, we're virtually standing on right now, it's not a very common bird at Medewa. and and even uh, throughout Northern Illinois, not all that common because it needs specialized types of habitat, which include mature trees and dead trees as well. For just a minute, let's think about other types of birds that use tree cavities for nesting. There are certainly other types of woodpeckers. Those include downy and hairy woodpeckers. There are black-capped chickadees, white-breasted nuthatches, house wrens, eastern bluebirds. There are birds of prey that commonly use nesting cavities in trees. Those are eastern screech owl in American kestrel. And these birds on my list here are all birds that we encounter here in Illinois. Can you imagine for a minute a duck that might nest in a tree cavity? Well, we've got two that I can think of right off the top of my head, and I've seen both of these at Medewin. Wood ducks nest in tree cavities, as well as hooded mergansers. And I've seen the young of both of those types of ducks in my bird monitoring area at Medewin, so I know they're there. Okay, now Laura, if you would skip slide six and go right to slide seven, we will come back to six. Thank you. Medewin has four streams passing through it. The stream at the bottom right corner of the slide is Jordan Creek. And then the large one that cuts through most of Medewin is Prairie Creek. And that's the one that we were standing on a bridge over just a moment ago. And Laura, were you circuit? Thank you. Laura is circling right sort of in the, on the very left border of this slide, that's the bridge that we were standing on and we're gonna go back to that bridge. Thank you, Laura. These two creeks, Jordan Creek and Perry Creek, empty into the Kankakee River. And the third creek from the bottom is Grant Creek. Thank you, Laura. And then the creek at the top of the slide on the left is Jackson Creek. Those two creeks flow into the Des Plaines River. During World War II, some of these streams were quite polluted with chemicals from the production of TNT. Now on the east side, excuse me, on the west side of Medewin, west of 53, that part of Medewin, uh, of the arsenal at the time, and Ron's gonna tell you a lot more about that here in just a few minutes, but that was where TNT, the actual explosive, was and the chemical runoff from that production of TNT dyed not only the water red, but the creek beds red, as well as plants and animals red. So there were red muskrats and met red beavers hanging around during those days. But today, those streams, all of our streams are much cleaner and they're carefully monitored as well, both for water chemistry and for invertebrate life. I wonder, well, why, do we, why would we monitor for invertebrate life if we're just looking for cleanliness of water? Well, science tells us that certain invertebrates don't tolerate pollution, chemical pollution in water very well at all. They only exist, they can only thrive in very clean water. Other types of invertebrates, and these are insect larvae, mussels, worms, anything that doesn't have a backbone. Other types of invertebrates can tolerate moderately water and some will will 
will do just fine in very polluted water. So by monitoring what type of invertebrate life is encountered in these streams in Medellin, give us a very good picture of the purity of the water in addition to the actual chemistry. So today, about nine species of mussels inhabit the creeks in Medellin, 40 different species of fish, and 23 species of reptiles and amphibians can be encountered in these waters. Laura, if you could go back to slide six, please. Now we're back on Prairie Creek Bridge, or the bridge over Prairie Creek, and we're looking down into the water and you can see it's nice clear water, but we also see some flat stones in that water. And this is evidence of the, the dolomite limestone that makes up the bed of this creek. And it's under several feet of topsoil uh, on, on dry land. But remember, we're only just a mile or two away from the Dolomite Prairie, which is, as you will recall, is where there's very little, if any, topsoil on top of the bedrock. This bedrock, this Dolomite limestone that is underground here at Medellin, is actually part of what's called the Nig Nigrarian Formation. And that rock, that bedrock formation extends all the way back to New York State. Niagara Falls. That's the same stone uh, uh, foundation, the same bedrock, the same formation that extends all the way here into the Midwest. Okay, Laura, uh, advance please. Slide eight. There we go. This is Prairie Creek where it empties into the Kankakee River. Now, who knew that there were waterfalls in Illinois? Well, there's not very many, but here's one right here. This small waterfall can be accessed from Lake Milligan, which is part of the Des Plaines State Fish and Wildlife Area. And you can go to Lake Milligan and look at this waterfall if you wish. It's, Lake Milligan is just east of Interstate 55 along North River Road, very close to uh, Medellin property. Now, this little falls was formed by glacial runoff where two different layers of sediment meet. And of course, the softer layer has been eroded over thousands of years. And the harder sediment was not eroded so much. So we've got a little waterfall here. Now, Laura, if you could skip to slide 10, please. Thank you. So we're back on the bridge again, and we're back looking east. And I would like you to look at the different types of habitat that we can see just from standing on this bridge right here. Of course, we have a riparian habitat. That's, that's habitat along a waterway or a river. And it's, of course, the, the water itself and the banks and the vegetation that occur along the, the waterway. If you look over to the right and sort of in the middle ground of the photograph, past that Fork tree, you see that there's a, a wide space of open land there. That's bunker field that I was talking about just a few minutes ago, and it is in pasture right now, but that is on its way to being restored. So there's a wide open grassland there. In addition to the, uh, uh, the wooded area that you see here uh, right up close to us and over to our left, you see that dead tree that we were talking about a little while ago, right at the very edge of the border. Now, uh, Laura, if you could advance the slide, please. We're going to do another th uh, 180, and we're going to look back to the, to the west. And we did change seasons again, you'll notice. But we have the riparian area that's right in the foreground. And then beyond that is another wide open grassland area, which right now is in, in pasture grass. But if you look further out past that open area, you see that there is woodlands. So right here on this bridge, we've got riparian habitat, we've got grassland habitat, we've got shrublands, we have woodlands, and this is what Medellin is all about. Diversity of habitat, and diversity of habitat equates to diversity of wildlife. 
And I'm sure sometime in the future, whether it's five years from now or 15 years from now, all of these pasture lands that currently have cattle on them will someday be restored to tall grass prairie as well. It's just a matter of time. Uh, next slide, please. We've crossed the bridge. We're continuing north on West Patrol Road toward our next stop. <clears throat> but as we go along this West Patrol Road, I'd like to point out a few other landmarks. To the left is an overgrown fence line, but it's not the property line of Medeo. Uh, west of this fence, the property extends about a mile further all the way to Interstate 55. And these are the lands that we were looking at from the bridge that were pasture lands, treblands, and woodlands. As we continue along this road right here, we're going to turn to the east and we're going to follow a short stretch of road that's going to take us into a, um, a very large former bunker field that is in the early stages of restoration. And the next slide, I'm, I'm getting ready to turn this over to Ron, but the very next slide, you'll see a road that's coming out of the bottom of the photograph into that bunker field. And that's the road we're going to turn on as we, uh, as we get ready to turn off the road to Ron. So, uh, Ron, I'm going to turn it over to you. And uh, Ron's going to be telling us about arsenal history and some unique features of the land, that land that's now under uh, restoration. Okay, thank you, Greg. What we have here is uh, the first slide, Laura. We have here is an aerial view of the bunker field. The road uh, on the bottom is, uh, and going up toward the right of the, the slide here, is uh, Schoolhouse Road. And it's an east-west uh, uh, road. And the bottom of it is we're probably half a mile from uh, Boathouse Road, uh, West Patrol Road, what Greg was talking about. As uh, you go up along this road, you'll see uh, maybe seven or eight rows of bunker fields, and then they end. Um, giving you more of an orientation to where we're at, toward the top of the slide, just to the right of the center, you see uh, maybe looks maybe inch and a half long uh, tree line with the road next to it. Well, that tree line is uh, parallel to the railroad tracks, which are parallel to Route 53. And the road on the right of that uh, tree line, right, Laura, coming down to the next tree line is Explosives Road. And when you hit that second tree line, that's where the Expo uh, Explosive Road uh, trailhead is, parking lot. So let's go back to uh, the bottom of the uh, picture here. Uh, the road uh, to the right is east-west road. You'll see pra uh, Prairie Creek meandering in and out. When we go back here, uh, how these bunker fields get here? Well, in the 1930s, the U.S. government was thinking, what's happening in Europe? We were thinking, do we have enough ammunition if we're going to become involved? Or do we have enough in ammunition to, uh, to uh, give to our allies if they're needed? Well, the answer to this, the government said, let's build 60 plus uh, arsenals throughout the country to uh, help uh, alleviate the, this problem. Two of them were built right here on the west side of Route 53, was the Kankakee uh, Ordnance Work. And on the east side was the Elwood Ordnance Work. Both were combined. Uh, in 1946, become a Joey ammunition plant. Before uh, ammunitions could be made, the government in 1940 started buying properties uh, to supply the uh, arsenal, have the room for it. They uh, talked to farmers and offered them $125 an acre and uh, offered all their family members that were capable enough, old enough, to work in the plants a job. Also, uh, there was uh, over 200 farmers uh, displaced. Uh, 14 schools were uh, removed and a couple churches. Several cemeteries still exist uh, in the Medellin uh, compound, but uh, they were never really a part of Medellin and they still are private cemeteries. So when the government started building or buying this land, 
1940, they put a pretty fast track on uh, building an arsenal. So by in mid-1941, ammunitions were really starting to be manufactured. It, the government spent about $8 million just purchasing the land and another $81 million to build the arsenal, which is quite an achievement to build uh, over 200 miles of roads. Um, there's 150 miles of railroads. Uh, there was 1,500 different types of buildings and about 400 bunkers uh, like these. Uh, the ones on the west side of Route 53 used to uh, were used to cure the TNT that was manufactured on the west side here. Where the, it's in the north of this area, you have that intermodal facility now. That was where the plant was, where the actual TNT was manufactured. After it was manufactured, it was brought to these bunkers, stored here to cure. And eventually, after curing, was taken to the east side by rail over the Iron Bridge, and uh, all the ammunitions were manufactured there. Uh, to build this arsenal uh, in the year, year and a half uh, before it started operations, uh, it took about 17,000 uh, of, of people in the workforce. That's almost as many as were employed here during the peak operations. Some say 15,000, some say 20,000. But really, in order to keep the arsenal going, they said they promised all these farmers uh, and their families uh, jobs. There still were short of jobs. There were so short of jobs, uh, the government even went to uh, Barbados and uh, Jamaica to bring in a workforce. At its peak, uh, over uh, was there five and a half million uh, pounds of TNT were produced every week. Total of, over the years were oh, almost a billion tons of TNT were produced. Uh, Medellin uh, took it over, and uh, most of these bunkers remain till a couple years ago. And uh, Christina will be talking about the project later about restoring them. But on the bottom of this, uh, the bottom row, you'll see to the right of the schoolhouse road, there's a open area. Those are about 30 bunkers that were removed maybe eight, seven, eight years ago, about a $30,000 piece uh, price tag to remove each one of them. The reason why they removed them early, uh, the hydraulics just on the site said, we needed to get rid of those to improve the groundwater uh, movements in this area. Okay, our, let me see the next slide, Laura. All these uh, bunkers, if you go to see existing today, you'll see that their, their floors were maybe three, four feet above the surrounding uh, areas. This is because they were all served by rail. So the floor of the rail was equal to the for the boxcars that it serviced it. Next slide, please. As Greg uh, noted, without uh, a fire or without grazing, the prairie would revert back to uh, a treed area, which has happened here since the arsenal didn't need these bunkers anymore. Next slide. Here's that same bunker in the previous slide where it, uh, demolition uh, started to take place. You can see here that each bunker was uh, covered by uh, about three feet of soil on top and on the sides are about 15 foot of soil. And they were constructed about a foot of uh, reinforced concrete. Uh, the bunkers were staggered. Uh, they were uh, 50, or, excuse me, 475 feet uh, apart from uh, north to south and from east to west were for 800 feet apart. And they were also staggered. So when, so if there was ever any mishap in one of these bunkers, uh, explosion would go through the weakest part, which would be the door. And it was far enough away from the next bunker that wouldn't cause a change reaction. Next bunker. If you want to see the inside of a bunker, uh, on the east side, off uh, closer to Iron Bridge Trail, you know, Route Group 63 uh, uh, Trail, 
there's well, probably three or four open bunkers along the trail. This one here is about a well, thousand feet east of uh, Henslow Road, uh, Henslow Trail, along the Bison Path. And a day like we've been having the last couple of days, heat, heat index is over 100. The temperature in these bunkers is probably 75, 80 degrees. So nice, cool spot to take a nice break if you're out on the prairie. Okay, next bunker. Okay, the next stop we're going to make along here would be on the, let me see, about the fifth or sixth row along the of bunkers along the road is where uh, the schoolhouse road makes that little turn. You'll see a little set of trees there. Those are mature poplar and oak trees. Next slide. Okay, we're looking at the, the road, looking uh, northwest here. You'll see this depression. It runs to the right and then goes around that set of mature trees and crosses the road again, or probably about five, 600 miles back. On the next slide, uh, we're looking uh, southwesterly. Next slide, Laura. You'll see this depression a little deeper here uh, on the going along uh, to the left here, going back to our Prairie Creek, which is about 500 feet from these roads. This, this depression was actually a, a meander of Prairie Creek at one time. It uh, came through here, went across the road, or went around the trees. So what happened to, why isn't it here anymore? Well, there's a couple theories. One is uh, the arsenal, like uh, Greg pointed out earlier, wanted to straighten out some of these streams. So they really straightened out Prairie Creek and uh, made this uh, little oxbow depression. Another theory is, which is probably most likely, is that during uh, heavy flood periods, there's so much uh, water, so much energy coming down uh, Prairie Creek that it couldn't make a turn. It just wanted to keep going straight and thus cutting off uh, this oxbow and actually cut a new channel. This was actually an oxbow lake, horseshoe lake, whatever you want to call them. Next one, Laura. Okay, we're at the second last row of bunkers to the east here. And if you look uh, north from the road, look between these bunkers, you see uh, hills. What are these hills? Well, looking closer, exploring, digging into them, you'll see they're, they're sandy and gravel deposits. This is a sandbar. You think, well, what's a sandbar doing in the middle of a prairie? Well, from, from when we left uh, the visitor center in the uh, part one, and we come all the way through, going back and forth here. Uh, we're all on the bottom of uh, once was glacial uh, Lake Waponsi. And this uh, sandbar was formed by uh, waters coming off the glacier was just the east of us. So the army, to save money, they said they didn't need the space in between them. They just dug the sandbars out, constructed the bunkers, and that was it. So uh, Laura, next one. So Christina will be talking about the restoration uh, about these areas later, but to get rid of these bunkers, the uh, staff and uh, volunteers first went around these bunkers, the whole area, the Sand Ridge area, because there's a lot of unique plants that existed there in the sandy areas. They uh, took these plants out, removed them, stored them, and on the next slide, You'll say they started to demolish the bunkers. They took the bunkers out. And on the next slide, they fill the areas back in, trying to get the original shape uh, of the sand area. So on the next slide, you see here that after it was reshaped, grass was different types of grasses were planted, and some of the original. Uh, of plants that were removed or placed uh, back in. Next slide. This is just a slide a couple seasons ago, planting uh, different types of vegetation on, uh, on that sand hill. There's a lot of unique uh, types of vegetation. You can even see cactus out there and other uh, sand loving, prairie loving uh, uh, plants and animals out there. So as we move on, I think Christina will be taking over.
Thank you, Ron. So now we move into the Prairie Glacial Plains Restoration Area, which is adjacent to this, uh, the bunker fields that uh, Ron was just describing. So this is going to become the largest restored area of the park. I don't know if you had a chance to see Medewin Prairie 101 Part 1, where we talked about the South Patrol Road Prairie Restoration Area, which was around 400 acres. So this restoration project is intended to be 1,800 acres. Um, it's a seven-year project, and in 2021, we're in the fourth year of the project. So I'll show you on the map later exactly how you would access this um, from Explosives Road Trailhead. But if you were to park at Explosives Road Trailhead, you'd see that to the north of Explosives Road, the area has already been prepared and seeded. This was done in 2019. So you'll start to see some of those native prairie plants thriving in that area. And then south of there, it's in a construction phase and still preparing for the restoration project. So the way that that is generally approached is to actually place the field first into a soybean patch, um, which seems counterintuitive, but soybeans are good at resisting the herbicides that they're designed to resist. And so you can treat, you can plant the soybeans, treat the area with the herbicide, and that herbicide will um, kill the invasive species. The soybeans will thrive and then they can be removed. And then you have sort of what we call sort of like a blank slate. So then the land is prepared for um, planting seeds or planting plugs that have been developed by the volunteers in the Forest Service. And so this is how you start out. This um, Prairie uh, Glacial Plains Restoration Project is a partnership between, of course, the USDA Forest Service who run the park, but also the Nature Conservancy, the National Forest Foundation and the Wetlands Initiative. Um, they just, they chose the plants um, that they're going to use for the restoration based on the unique soil topography and moisture of these areas and also the historical records such as Ron was talking about the surveys they did before they even began the restoration. Um, and the idea behind the, the Prairie Glacial Plains is that it would connect the 400 acre South Patrol Road Prairie um, past those bunker fields, this whole 1800 acre area. Again, we're still on the, the west side of the park. And then over the Iron Bridge Trail, it would connect you to the Iron Bridge Trail Prairie Restoration Area. So you have a very nice, long, contiguous habitat for birds and for um, all of the animals and plant species, but also it's a nice for the visitors of the park to have a very long, contiguous, restored prairie. You can go to the next slide. So the activities that the volunteers and the Forest Service have to undergo to restore these areas is not just planting. As I said, um, they have a lot of preparatory phases they go through, and that also includes removing uh, fences. Uh, there's a lot of barbed wire that was either put there for grazing animals or for the, the Army's control of movements in these areas. And so this is an example of staff and volunteers removing old barbed wire fencing and posts that once divided the area. You can go to the next slide. Ron did a really nice job describing the bunkers in detail. This is an example of a bunker that is in the process of being deconstructed. So um, what you'll see in the bidet when among these bunkers is always that sort of trapezoidal entrance way with the door that uh, Ron showed the, the train car pulling up. And then it's generally covered in soil. That was part of the preventative measures. Remember these bunkers were containing dynamite. And so um, they piled soil on top for, for uh, reasons of protection. And then those become, you know, uh, they, they become like habitat basically for invasive species and other types of shrubs. And so that has to all be removed before they can do the demolition. And so this is a, a example, a picture of one that had that done already. And then these are broken up and taken away. Go to the next slide. So this is an example of the restored prairie uh, in the Prairie Glacial Prairie's northern part. Um, which shows, of course, everybody's favorite um, pale purple coneflower and um, also some prairie coreopsis there with that beautiful little yellow flower. And um, these both are considered pollinator plants and they attract bees and butterflies and other insects that pollinate and spread seed and help this prairie thrive. Can go to the next slide. So the reason, so the way that, the reason why the um, Prairie Glacial Plains has that name is that um, if you look in this picture, we're actually, see how the land sort of 
rises at the end of this road. This is Explosives Road, which I said I'll show you on the map in a moment. Um, and this is, in fact, the end of uh, a glacier uh, in the sense of the, the glacier was, um, per, it was advancing here and also melting at the same time. So the glacier actually almost seems to come to a standstill because it's pushing material and rock and debris forward, but it's melting simultaneously. And so it deposits a lot of foreign uh, erratic objects in this area and it pushes the land into this, this sort of hilly shape. And so um, if you drive around Northern Illinois, you'll actually see a lot of these ups and downs and they are a result of glaciation. And um, this particular uh, area is considered a, to be a top of a glacial moraine. And so therefore we have the um, Prairie Glacial um, Restoration Area. And actually the difference in elevation between Medewan's lowest point to his highest point is actually over 150 feet. You can go to the next slide. So here's an example of something that we would call an erratic. This is a granite boulder. Um, it actually is not in its original location because the army uh, didn't, it moved it uh, out of, it was inconveniently placed. We don't know exactly where it was exactly placed before, but it's been put back um, into um, this field here. And being that it's made of granite, it's not um, native, it's not common in this area. The granite um, came likely from um, the north in the Wisconsin area. And if you look around, you see there's just, it's completely uh, alone and it stands out as a you know, not a uh, natural feature. And so this is just an example of how you can see signs of glaciation. We actually have a geology tour that is usually done in person every year by a very lovely and, and um, educated uh, geologist. He has done a couple of webinars. You can watch them on the, um, the, uh, the Midday One website in case you're curious about more of this geology stuff. Um, so you can actually see as you walk around Medewin and in all of Illinois, you'll see large boulders that are often pushed to the side by the farmers that are a result of glaciation. You can go to the next slide. So we actually are coming from the inside of the park now to the trailhead. So what you would see if you were going to come with your car to this area is sort of a, in a like, in a, it's very inconspicuous sign of a hiker and a right, you know, it tells you that you can go park on this um, explosive rolls trailhead and you'll see these ballasts, as we call them, these barriers. These are intended to prevent a truck from getting to the trailhead because there's no turnaround for the truck. They actually get stranded. But as you come there with your car, you're welcome to weave in and out of these barriers and find your way back um, to the trailhead. This is on Route 53. Um, and so if you look in the distance, you actually see the bison herd. So that's across Route 53, and that is the bison pasture, which we're going to go to in just a moment. And you can um, you can see them actually uh, from a distance here if you're lucky. And then the Welcome Center is actually about two miles here to the south. You can go to the next slide. So I get the, the privilege of talking about the bison herd. Um, everybody's favorite uh, thing to see when they visit Medewin is the reintroduced bison herd. So bison are native to this area. Um, and of course they were eradicated. Um, but in the fall of 2015, the Medewin initiated um, a bison herd on a portion of the park. It's about a thousand acres actually on the west, uh, sorry, on the east side of the park. Um, and they began with four bulls and 23 cows. Um, these is a conservation herd. So they're, they're as pure bison as possible. They have as little cow genetic material in them as possible. So they're, they're very pure um, genetically, uh, genetic bison. And the current herd has about 60 animals. It did reach up to 100 in 2019, but several are sent away each year to other organizations that want a conservation herd, so a genetically pure herd, in order to maintain the genetic diversity and keep the herd at the optimal size for the pasture and the bison experiment. So the bison experiment is actually, um, it's not, they're not just there to attract tourists or, you know, because they used to be here. They're actually there to help heal the prairie. Their job is to, to um, forage in the way that they would normally, to dig, to wallow, you know, to to trample the prairie because that's what, how the prairie naturally was, um, that's how it was in its natural state. And so the thought is that it will be restored more quickly and be healthier and thrive better if the natural animals that were there are reintroduced. And so there's an experiment going on to see if that is true, to see if the prairie actually does recover better with the presence of the bison. You can go to the next slide. So this is the bison pasture here in with the striped um, 
grayed area. That's the um, the bison uh, fence surrounding that area, and um, you can't you can't really mingle with them. The public is kept outside of the bison fence for for now, at least. And so, but you can see them from a couple different locations. The um, parking lot that's indicated there is what we call the Iron Bridge uh, Trailhead, and from there you can walk a very short distance to the um, very north part of the of the bison pasture. And then you have a couple choices. You can actually go south along Route 53 to the Southwest Bison Overlook. There are benches and high powered um, bison scopes like you would see at a zoo or something. There's um, some scopes there. You may get lucky and see them from there. You may see them along the way, or you could go to the east and travel down um, this trail to another set of bison scopes where the, that arrow is. Um, and that um, is another place where you might be able to see them with the high powered scopes. And sometimes you see them right when you walk up to the trail. There's been plenty of times where they're just standing right there. They do have a thousand acres to roam. And so, you know, it's a, uh, it's a nice day. It's a pleasant day. If you get to see the herd, it won't be every time. Um, but, you know, we hope that, that you do get a chance to see them. We do have a, a six foot tall exterior fence and a five foot tall interior fence. And um, it can, it, it's, it, it's for the moment, excluding the public from uh, mingling with them. Uh, and we'll see if in the future we have any other, you know, plans for expanding that current pasture, but that's the pasture for the moment. You can go to the next slide. This is an example of those scopes um, and benches uh, and that are available to the public at, at no cost. And you can take a look at the bison. You can go to the next slide. So, uh, we actually additionally have a webcam on our website, uh, or I should say on the Forest Service website. And uh, this is really lovely. I have taken many of my family and friends to see the Medewin, and actually they all, all of them have gotten lucky and actually had a chance to see the bison. And I, so there are a, a lot of people that enjoy this webcam and can log in from all over the world and see what the bison are up to. It's not at the Iron Bridge Trailhead, so don't, think if you look on the webcam that they're there, um, it's in a little bit different location, but it's very fun to watch them have their natural behaviors. There's other animals that partake in the webcam. As you can see here, we have a very curious red-tailed hawk that is cracking everybody up because it seems to like to take cameos um, and then a loggerhead shrike there. And there's other animals that sometimes end up in the webcam, but you can feel free to go to the website and look at that anytime and hopefully you'll get a peek at the herd. You can go to the next slide. And then finally, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about our um, online resources. So I mentioned the website for the Forest Service. That has an immense amount of wonderful material. It has um, self-guided tours, which are um, very interesting, very, very interesting stuff. People put a lot of time into the historical aspects of the park, um, whether it's the arsenal history or um, some of the farming history. Uh, we have an archaeologist that actually is part of the Forest Service team. Um, and then there's uh, lots and lots of information about the, the fauna and flora of the park. Um, so much to learn there. And in addition to that, there's actually an app for your cell phone by the um, OnCell. You can download it for free from the App Store, whatever you use for your phone. And it has a lot of nice resources. It has those self-guided interpretive hikes, several of them, which you can carry with you. Um, it has maps. It has uh, also maps that refer to the areas that are allow hunting, and it gives you a wealth of information about the park. Um, and it's it's very it's frequently updated, and it, they're expanding its um, application uh, every year. And then we also participate in the iNaturalist. We have an iNaturalist group, so that's an app that is like a crowdsourced plant and animal and insect identification. Uh, group and so it, people use it all over the world. But there's a Medewin group, so if you're at the Medewin and you catch some photos of different animals or different plants, you can upload them to iNaturalist app, identify them, and have other people help you identify them. And e we're also part of eBird, which is um, another crowdsourced uh, sighting and identification app. So look into those and look into the website, and I will turn it back to our host. Thank you for listening. Unmuted first. Wonderful. I'm so glad that we ended with the bison. Um, that's just such the treat. And if I run into people that know about Medewin, that's typically 
what they refer to the bison. But over the course of these last two programs, you've been able to show us that there's so much more. Um, we don't have a lot of time. And of course, we were given some really great questions. So if it's okay with you, Laura, we'll answer what we can. And then you and I can work together to do another blog post because I think that uh, met our audience's needs. But um, one of the questions that came up, um, it's directed to you, Greg. And it's, does the prairie flood frequently because we're in the Great Plains? And is that a problem or is that typical? Well, that's actually a good question because we don't really think of prairies being wet, but there are actually multiple kinds of prairies, some of which are, are wet prairies. And one example of that is at both the um, west end of the South Patrol Road Restoration Area and at the east end of the South Patrol Road Restoration Area and spots in between, those are actually wet prairies. So at different times of the year, usually in the spring, those can, those can hold water. And it's, and, it's, and it's a natural part of, uh, of that type of prairie. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if perhaps we were thinking wetlands and grasslands and prairies, but thank you for clarifying that. Uh, prairies can be several things. I'm going to ask one more question, I think, um, because I think it's really relevant to all of the things you've been featuring, and that's what are the keystone species or are there keystone species that Medewin is working to bring back to the area? Hmm. That's, that's a good question. I'm not sure if I know the answer. Laura can, or, or any of my other colleagues, can you guys expound on that? Uh, yeah, I can. Um, so that's a great question. I'm sorry for the mask, but I'm in the office, so I do have to wear a mask. Um, so, if you throw out the term keystone species, to me, um, that would be grassland birds. So not just one species, but uh, grassland birds are um, include several different species. Um, and they are important to Medewin because that's one of the reasons why this area and this land um, was tried so hard to be protected is because there were grassland birds found here, even back when it was the arsenal. Um, and so the presence of these grassland birds, several different species, and, and Greg can talk a little bit more about them um, since he's a, a avid birder, but these grassland birds, um, you know, their, their presence here at Medewin, definitely, I would call that a, a keystone species for sure. Um, they're here now. They, a lot of them nest in the summertime here. And they need, um, you know, very special habitat, large expanses of grass at, at certain heights. And because of their presence here, we know um, we're continuing to do a good job at, at restoring the area. Okay, thank you for that. I thought through Christina's presentation or the aspect that she shared, I think prior to this question being asked, I might have assumed that bison were keystone species, but now I have the appreciation of they're here more on an experimental basis to see if they're helping our prairie with its restoration. So that's really fascinating. Um, let's see, I think I can squeeze in another question. And um, this one has a few upvotes. Are there any things that humans can do to help get rid of the pollutants like TNT that already exist in the water? I can and answer that. Thank yeah, you. so um, one of the things that I found really interesting, not just in the day one, but in um, some of the other restoration areas in the parks in Illinois is that when, when Greg was talking about the rivers and creeks being channelized by, you know, in this case, the military, a lot of times it was farmers. Um, and then there were drain tiles put in to, to drain the water immediately off the land and then into a channelized creek and then dump it into a, a major waterway to, to make the fields dry and tillable. That concentrates a lot of the pollutants and uh, interferes with the natural cleaning process of the water. 
And so you'll see there's several projects where they try to like make the creeks meander again. They actually try to, to, to get them to, to flow naturally and then break those brain, drain tiles up. So the land cleans the water before it gets to the creek. And then the creek itself has a more natural flow that's not channelized. And then by the time the water gets to a major waterway, a lot of the pollutants have been taken out by filtration process. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Restoring wetlands is another way that Medea Wind is taken care of this. Um, wetlands are a natural uh, cleaner of uh, pollution. So originally, I think there was about 5,000 acres of uh, wetlands in, in uh, Medea Wind, and they're going to restore probably at least 3,500, 3,500 3, acres to help uh, with the water cleaning. So we're actually with we're still in the project there's lots of work left to do like the 1800 acre project okay so if someone's interested there's something for everyone yes. wonderful Absolutely. i I think I'll wrap up at this point, but I assure you that if you've asked a question and we didn't answer it, Laura and I will work together and within the next week, we'll have um, answers to those outlying questions in a blog on the C2ST website. Um, and if you were with us for the first program and we didn't get to all the questions, we did um, offer a blog for those as well. Um, we wanna answer as many questions as we can because we would really love to get people out to this space. Um, it's a hidden treasure an hour away from the city. So I think at this point, I'm going to say thank you for taking time out of your busy day to join us. Thank you to Laura and Bron and Greg and Christina for your valuable time and expertise. Uh, thank you, Laura, for your work with me and us behind the scenes. And if you've joy enjoyed today's program, please considering consider donating so that we can offer other programs like this. And we do ask you to take a few extra minutes to give us your feedback so we can plan future programs that will help answer your science and society related questions. You can evaluate today's program at c2st2.cnf.io. Next Thursday on August 19th, you can join us at 6 p.m. as we continue to celebrate Argonne National Lab's 75th anniversary with a program focused on nuclear energy. And summer's not over. Sneak out to Medewin and see the beauty for yourself. Thank you again for joining us.